Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Well, welcome back to everyone for the uh, final session. The uh, first speaker this afternoon will be Peter Montgomery, and his title is ECM, Then and Now. Well, thank you, and then refers to 1985, when the lifted curve method was discovered by Henry Klenstra. And most of you know what it means to factor a number into primes. And uniqueness play a role because the algorithms find one factor typically, then go ahead and look for more. And it won't matter which one we start with. And so we'll think about the attempts to factor, well, I guess it was. 25 years ago or more, and we're given some n, often it will maybe something from the Cunningham table, which has the small basis to 12 to moderate powers, plus or minus 1, and there will be two main classes of methods that were active then. Some work on the product itself, or, and uh, others uh, may work modulo the product, but the time they depend depends upon the size of the factor we hopefully find. So that discounts the, the time for multiple precision operands. So for, for depending primarily on the size, this, this occurred just as continued fraction was being replaced by quadratic sieve in the algorithm of comparisons. And both the continued fraction and the quadratic sieve find many values y, which are congruent to squares and are smooth, meaning only small prime factors. If we get several x squared congruent to y mod n, multiply all the x's together, and square that, and you should get the product of all the y's. So the square of the product of all the x's is automatically a square for the left side, and the product of the y's has to be chosen so that every prime appears to an even power, which turns out is a linear algebra problem on two. So, example of the flavor of quadratic sieve, take our room number and subtract 1919 from many different squares near there. <clears throat> Let's see, is that uh, not quite right? And you know, the closest square to 1919 is 1936, 14 squared 1936, and we get a 17 difference. And we've got, we just saved the ones where we have. So uh, factors from a factor base on the right. Well, notice that we have no threes. That's because a particular polynomial x squared minus 1919 never takes on a value divisible by three. But when we get enough of them, well, we notice that. 29 and 37 on the right, 
look somewhat alike in terms of whether the powers are odd or even. Two minuses, then two fives, two sevens, and two elevens. <laughs> the product of those two is a square. And we can use that to, <laughs> if we're lucky, get a factorization. <coughs> so seven, 70 squared is the product of the two, or the, the two that we decided to combine have a product of square, which happens to be 770 squared. And from the derivation of these is f of something or a square minus 1919, we can say that this is 29 squared minus n and 37 squared minus n. And when we follow the congruence, we get two squares that are congruent mod n. And if we're lucky, as we are here, we get <coughs> two numbers that are incongruent. And 303 has got a factor 101, as does 1919. But the elliptic curve will have a much different flavor than this. So it's among the one <laughs> whose time will depend upon n. And a uh, trial and division is the easiest one to program. And night, the prime, for, first prime factor, 19, is so small, we, we can easily, re easily recognize it even by hand. <laughs> so p minus 1 relies upon Fermat's little theorem. If you take any base that's co-prime to our n 1919 and raise it to the 198, well, or to be, should we raise it to our prime power minus one, where the prime power, or the prime is the one we want to find. So like 19 minus 1 or 101 minus 1. And if it's a variation in the algebra, we got a p plus 1 due to Hugh Williams. And, and the power row at the top, just take the sequence typically replacing x by x squared plus 1 mod n. and then inputting that to another stage and hoping to get a duplicate mod n somewhere. So I said briefly about the p minus one method. We're given our n and we don't know offhand that it's going to be 19 and 101, or when we subtract one from them, 18 and 100. <coughs> but we pick, a, we do pick a bunch of powers which hopefully are divisible by both by both 18 and by 100. I, maybe you pick 3,600 for the seconds, uh, seconds of my talk. <laughs> and so raise some base to a power which we picked and can use the binary method of exponentiation once on a big product, or you can do each prime power within the range separately. So we get some new value out and this has an e as its exponent. If p minus 1 divides e, then our b naught to the p minus 1 
will be 1 mod p. And we don't have to go quite that high. See, p minus 1. So, yeah, let's see. So, p minus 1 divides e. So, yeah, it divides this exponent and b b naught to the p minus 1 will have our factor p and when we do a greatest common divisor uh, we'll be lucky unless uh, two primes turn up at one time which doesn't happen very much in practice beyond the early stages so this is more a much bigger example of how the p minus one behaved and I picked it as Richard Brent got a record on it. But so we don't know at this time for or at the, at the time we imagine ourselves thirty years ago, knowing what the factorization will be except Certainly the six and the seven digit ones could be found by trial division and even easier. The form of the number ensures that each of the primes over here will be one mod 977. So there's only a few thousand tries for these two. But then we get up a ways. 19 and 32 digits, and <coughs> so much higher. We've gone since then. So when we we try it, if if we had, didn't already do it by the trial division, then we might guess to put in. A, a thousand for our upper bound, so we do all the exponents up to a thousand. Well, unfortunately, we'd ever, um, I mean, we should also be careful here that our base b naught is not two or a power of two, because that one raised to whatever power we pick will give us back a one for all the factors at the same time. But if you start with B naught being three, it should be fine. Except that when we get up to about a thousand and do our check on the exponent, suddenly both of them have got the 977 at one time put in. And we'll still get the product of the six digit and seven digit factors out. And but all of the big ones will be in the do later list. <laughs> and however, when we do look at the other factors, they, uh, or for the 19 digit minus one, the largest prime factor is about half a million, and it's not that not that far to worry about going up to at least not today. This is three hundred digit numbers to be manipulating in the slower computing days, <laughs> but certainly feasible. Right. This one eleven million requires us to go up even higher, and there were enough good. Ones, uh, I think, John Brillhart, who talked to or Selfridge, one of them pocket, picking plums at waist height. <coughs> so, this one might be found, but until we go through and do a, a repeat checks with higher values of our exponent. This one's unlikely to be found. The repeat checks is, is 
a bigger exponent b might find it when the old one was unsuccessful. And now we get that improved by putting in the so-called second step. Little b sub 1 was our output of the first exponentiation. And so, and if, if there's some factors, well, oh, today, this, the test is just to worry about finding multiple factors and, and then going back and continuing on the cofactor if it looks promising. But after we've done our exponentiation with all of the primes up to a little, up to a big B1, we look for that exponent to only need one more factor before popping out with a one mod r prime. And several variations of trick or no, but we're looking for one more prime we can apply after we hit the, the b sub one value such that Let's see. That's what I want here. The group order. Oh, okay, this is this is supposed to be like in parens up to here. So the group order mod p minus one c over p z multiplicative. It has to divide our extra factor Q times the one we already applied to the exponent. And oh, then if we are lucky, then our little b1 output to the qth power, well, by definition of the b1 output, and then putting both primes in, Q and E together, we'll get one modulo or a prime and, and figure out our prime by a GCD test. So if, if B1 to the Qth power will give us a one, <coughs> Then the strategy is to find two different powers of B1, not necessarily one being the zeroth power, which uh, have some factor of Q. Uh -huh. When we set the exponent difference to Q, we want to be able to get two results of the same mod P. And one strategy I've been using for a P plus or minus one code I was developing at the time. Just split a bunch of subscripts or indices beneath our capital B sub two into okay. two disjoint sets, but they don't have everything in them. Just some, some, everything, every potential Q would be we divide some difference, i minus j, where i was in one set and j in the other. <clears throat> and we plan on just doing pairwise comparisons and take, take, take the greatest common divisor every time of a difference. So, and we try to be somewhat clever in the selection of the sets. If we're 
got to have any potential difference up to 50, but we, we know it's prime, and we also know it's, say, bigger than 5, then noticing that <coughs> every such prime has to be in the, these congruences classes mod 10, and we can write it as the next multiple of 10 minus 1, 3, 7, or 9. <coughs> so then we're down to 4 times 5. The difference is to worry about manipulating. And, and so we get one set of values for these four and a second set of values for these five and put them in a table or do or arrange it in order to, that you don't have to store them and take the difference of the two powers and GCD it within. Um, we we'll do that a bit better if we combine two values with one negated, so b to the b1 to the i plus b1 to the minus i minus the pair with the j's, and this will give us only half as many GCDs to worry about <coughs> later on, and we can perhaps spot it by hand that. If, if these two are congruent modulo or prime, and then the other two are also congruent <coughs> when we, as long as we allow denominators that aren't divisible by the prime. So we do cut down, and now we only need each q to divide some sum or difference. And, and Reduce the size of the table a small bit. So back to that two to the nine and seventy seventh minus one. The for the third we we got the nineteen digit factor earlier, we hope, with by going up to half a million on step one. Well, now that we're in our, maybe our second pass through everything, we, maybe we try, <coughs> try two million for our B sub one and, and some bigger value, like 20 million for B sub two, then then raising to that seven digit power, let's tell, or get, get rid of anything that's not of this order, and, and then we hope that two of our table entries will correspond to values of i minus j that divide this. And yeah. and if they do, then we'll luck out and get our 32 to factor and still have the, the two huge ones at the bottom to figure out another day, or maybe I should say another decade. <laughs> so I say that was found by Richard Brent when he was going through many of the tables. And uh, I couldn't find in Wagstaff's old tables precisely when they started keeping records, but I rem remember this was a record for several years, and I found out it was found in 1984. And I mentioned it would take a lot of 
GCDs and they're rather expensive, whether it's a multiplicative inverse or just the greatest common divisor we want. And one optimization, if we've got two different ones to, to check for a factor with n, check their product against n first. And, and then also make sure that the product that you went to didn't suddenly become zero and discard all your old history information. <laughs> And so then essentially one multiply each to keep, to keep a running product of what you haven't tested yet. So another topic, we're going through the P plus one algorithm, we'll be using Lucas functions also called Chebyshev polynomials because very similar identity is held by double the cosine function, which when you then write the cosine in terms of exponentials takes you, takes you right back to this form. And so there's polynomials just sending something plus is reciprocal to the sum of the two powers of the power of the number and the power of reciprocal. And for computing those, a couple of big identities that you can apply it to get the sum of the, the initial, indices. Evaluate the polynomial, m plus nth case of the polynomial by multiplying the m and nth and subtracting the one at their difference and uh, using the formal identity it's quick to check that that holds. And another useful one is a product and it may not be obvious at first that it's even commutative in M and N, but you do a small bit of algebra and you get it. And the Montgomery ladder was mentioned that case when you make the M and N consecutive everywhere and keep having, but you can also make use a Fibonacci like chain to try to go up to the high. <laughs> so the P <coughs> plus one <coughs> method, instead of picking B sub naught, which was co-primed to our N, we pick essentially a, a value of, of x plus 1 over x, but we'll call it y naught. We, we don't have our x and 1 over x explicitly, but actually we're hoping that they do not exist in the base field. <laughs> so we raise it to a power, or a Luca power, maybe I should say, and just to come back to the now. Oh yeah, if our so if our y one starting value. It happens to be the form B1 plus 1 over B1. Then applying it, or that should be a, a y, y0, I think. No. No, I guess I, as long as I got 
ones and here all three places, or zeros at all three places. <laughs> so So if we have y one in here, we get b when we subtract off our two, we get b one minus one squared in the factorization, and we we'll, we'll still find the p minus one factors, if our choice of why not means there's a solution in the base field mod p. But if not, we go after something else. So after we've chosen why not, then we'll see what the x naught is that corresponds to it, whether it's in the ring mod p or or not, there'll at least be a solution in the quadratic extension. And the product of the two roots is plus one, so one over x naught must be the other root. But we also notice by applying Frobenius, but we get another root uh, at x naught to the p. And we have only two roots over a field, but and we're working them over a ring right now. And our x naught to the p must equal either x naught or or one over x naught, and when we, when we look at what our output would be for it, yeah, we substitute for why not, and then Use, use the definition of b sub e, so we get the piece powers here, and then the factors, regardless of whether uh, which, which root this was. And if it was the same as the pth power, then it's in the base field, and we've essentially just found the p minus 1 factor of when we're lucky. Probably a few more computations than otherwise needed. But when it's a reciprocal, our luck will occur with p plus one being nicely smooth instead of p p minus one. Yeah. So this will say if p plus one divides our e and. So when p minus one happens to divide our e, we're we're lucky half the time, depending upon what what choice we made for for our why not. And when p plus one divides our e, we're also lucky half the time. So it generally had to be run a few times. So So if if we give p plus one the earlier number, 
Well, yeah. 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 at least get rid of the problem we had with the 977 popping out for both of them at the same time. <laughs> but but we don't have anything new. In fact, the 19 and the 32 don't produce this time. Unless, unless we happen to pick what, the why not so that P minus 1 would be our lucky one. So P. Yeah, I had to, I had to go up to 300 for B1, even though it looks like 79 is the biggest, because we got 17 squared, and we might not have been careful to put put enough of them in our exponent. But nothing new coming out. <laughs> So switch subject slightly again. <laughs> Goldwasser talked about Pockleton's test earlier this week when and we try to prove that a given integer is prime and one way of assuring it is if when we raise it to something to that power minus one, we get one, but raise that same x into powers that divide our first exponent, and they all give us something other than one. So, right, the next page has the illustration of what's happening. So, we add 67 dividing 2010 earlier. And, well, the algorithm's recursive, so we we'll assume that we've already proven that 2, 3, and 11 are prime. Well, first condition was that x to the n minus 1 had to be 1 on our capital N, and, well, x to the n minus 1 is going to be 0 here. <laughs> and x equal 1 failed because it said not congruent to for the next ones. But we can pick x equal 2 and we, for Fermat's criteria, when we're cheating and know it's prime, <laughs> All right. we can figure out, see that the order of 2 divides 66, but when we try any of these, <laughs> divide, 66 divided by 2, 3, 11, by any of those primes, our 2 to that power will not be 1. So, so we can see, for example, 37 cubed will be 2 to the 66 or 1, but 37 itself is not 1, so 37 must have order 3. And likewise, the other primes, it's a slightly harder argument for prime powers, and there, but big observation is that, that to apply this, we needed to factor 66 completely. And, and our assumption. And then we'll notice that we, we need to get all, all nice powers in the P plus or minus one, too. That, that's going to be similarity coming up. So, I have to give a P minus one, or P plus one analog and we can get some Lukács sequences have this form that are essentially 
dif difference of powers, right, but difference of values and stuff like the definition of the Fibonacci numbers, for example, or the explicit formula for them. And yeah, if this, these sequences satisfy some tests similar to the Pocklington ones, then we can prove that our exponent is, is prime. <clears throat> So, so we got to check that the bottom coefficient of our polynomial was non-zero, and so a te Sandy test on the discriminant of the polynomial, and some other <laughs> conditions. Let us prove using these sequences that we get a prime out, and here. We're needing all the factors of yeah n plus one equal product of uh, different q to different powers. We need to know the full factorization of p plus or n plus one here, and so. So there were some works by Selfridge, Lamer, Brillhart, and probably others came up with some improved primality tests where we don't need the full factorization of either one, but it's enough factors of both. I think there was some example given on the number theory network this last week. Um, both the technique, but, but the, the, product, the factors you find have to account for one third of the n squared minus one logarithmically. Then a few simple tests and practice complete you know, factorization. So the big question coming up among the researchers is if we can mix the n plus 1, n minus 1 here, can we mix them in the p plus 1, p minus 1 algorithms? And so that's... First boy, and maybe we can go to p plus or minus two and <coughs> get something else that might be smooth after we do the p plus or minus one, and or just make some fundamental change to the algorithm where we can allow another step after we get a little b sub one from an exponentiation and search it in the tables for our match. Maybe we can find a way to look even more. So this was uh, seen, as I remember, the world just before Andrew Olitsko sent me Hendrix right up. And so in order to use virus draws form for elliptic curves, we'll assume that it's not nothing's characteristic two or three. Those are easy primes to find. <laughs> <coughs> so the virus draws equation is a cube is uh, cubic and Short form is it's got cubic term on the right and linear and constant terms. Oh, well, 
There's another coordinate system we'll get to briefly later. And we haven't had the picture on the board today, but most of you have probably seen uh, where we draw this loca. The pictures look different depending on whether we've got one real root or three real roots on the right. And we put a curve or a straight line through two points that we want to add and then reflect it. So and we get an abelian group uh, whose order is approximately p, but we have more than just the two values of p plus one and p minus one that can pop out. It's, uh, Almost a random game, Las Vegas style. <laughs> and yes, yeah, so that group order varies with A and B, and there, there's some strategies for selecting A and B, like the, 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 the six torsion that Dan Bernstein mentioned yesterday. So yeah, here's the group wall. So to, to add two points on the curve, you find the third point on the curve where that same line intersects the curve. So. Given, say, P and Q, draw the line through them, and then we reflect that in, along the x-axis. This should be more vertical. And that's defined to be the, the sum. And <coughs> all of the algebraic operations of determining a slope here and getting the the third root of the equation where we try to substitute the, or eliminate one of the variables from the line equation and, and get our final curve. They're all arithmetic and plus minus uh, subtract, multiply, divide and carry over to finite fields. But, and in fact, we'll be wanting to do it to to, to commutative rings, modulo the number of refractoring. But so, example, which the picture doesn't correspond to is take. Two of the points you can check are on the, the curve, and we see by hand that the, set, the y coordinate in the example is two more than the x coordinates. So, so the line passing through is y equals x plus two, and then when we try to eliminate y from the cubic equation, and and a formula for y. We get the cubic, and we know that the x coordinates 0 and minus 2 are on here if we have made an arithmetic error. And that lets us follow through and get the new, when we get the new x, uh, 3 from 1 squared minus 2, or minus 0 and minus a negative 2, we, we get our new x and then <coughs> plugging it into 
x plus 2 and negating we get a new y. So, based upon these curves, Hendrik Lindstra denounced the elliptic curve factorization algorithm. And we select some curve and a point on it. It could be as simple as picking the coefficient a in y squared equals x cubed plus ax plus b, and then picking an x naught y naught, and then solving for b, and proceeding from there. So we pick, pick our first bound for exponentiation, and then we multiply the scalar e by our initial point, P naught, and the case covered in Leinster's note was when we fail in this, during this exponentiation, that would be when we try to compute a slope, but we divide by zero modulo one prime, but not modulo another prime, and even though it may be hard to program accurately to continue, it's, <laughs> it's a lucky charm. <laughs> and if it, for finite means, we, we don't strike any divide by zero for any prime. And if we go back to one and try again on the same number or pick the next number from your input stream. <laughs> And for step two, where we were comparing before the b1 to a power plus b1 to the negative of that power, and needed to get two subscripts where either the sum or the difference was visible by our q. Now we do something similar here and hope that the order over one of the primes divides our prime q that's not known yet, but it's slightly larger than our first bound, but not as big as our second bound. So uh, our scalar multiplication, the analog exponentiation, gives an output point, which under our assumptions would have order Q and my proposal for doing the comparisons was simply to take I times our output point and J times our output point from the values to do the big comparison of, much as they're done in the P plus or minus one methods. And so, yeah, we need. Can't do it unless Q divides one of our sums or differences. So Cunningham tables keep track of all these results, and they're a measure of how successful an algorithm is. And Sam Wax, I wish is what they call it a page. Oh, the length seems to vary from the, over the seasons, and the pages have been awfully short recently because it takes a lot of room to write down 70-digit factors and stuff that are being found by number fields there. But uh, just, uh, just a month or so after ECM algorithm came out, uh, the first page and 10 examples where, where it was done. I think they are mostly by me. Ack and Rickart got an early implementation too. Uh, but 
P minus one was well into the lead at that time, but over the next three months or so, ECM <laughs> got a bit more. And one of them was done two ways and cut the half, but there's still plenty of P minus one, P plus one powered row. And the other big surprise is that that was just as quadratic sieve came out for, with a multi-polynomial version and Silverman got pretty fast on it. So, whereas the extended fraction had been in use the previous page. So, small print and the y axis maintains the tables. Just be before the first column you saw, when ECM was not known, he's been receiving new factors somewhat more slowly than in previous years. But after, after those both have been put in, he saying from page 31, that the quadratic CF and elliptic curve method are, have been getting great success. So, trained to strategy, uh, of course. <laughs> and affecting the, the elliptic curve in the hardware side during the time since 85. So, some of the big things have been 64-bit hardware we can do multiple precision cheaper typically today than back then. And the algorithm can be adapted for multi-core and for, I'll show you the next page where memory can come into use. So far <laughs> it's been very nominal memory that we had the two tables to compare. And went, gone from megabytes to gigabytes, typical configuration in an office. So what the well, biggest thing the memories do is enable fast polynomial arithmetic. The algorithms were known well before 1985, but they weren't practical in the limited memories where the two sets we compare might have a million items each. And it's a bit big to fit, and then we need two, maybe a logarithm or two times that much data to, to hold all our intermediates. But my dissertation, as well as Paul Zimmerman's 20 years of ECM, have made use of the space. So, <laughs> coordinate systems we've heard mentioned here of the twisted Edwards coordinates. I, Dan talked about the torsion group, order six yesterday. And instead of the virus draws, it started off. And this, uh, this two to the nine seventy seven minus one got completed a few years ago, so, so 23 years from getting the, the, the last factor till now, and group order was lucky, so it's, so I think, I think I read that the, the step one bound B1 was 110 million, so we're going up fairly high today. We're, we're, And after Bruce Dotson did this, they checked the cofactor and it finally passes one of the prime tests. <laughs> so, so now we're trying to look for more Mersenne factors that size. And there was a record a few years ago we passed the 1024-bit 
point for so-called special number field curves, where the announcement earlier this year about RSA 768 was for general number field state, where we don't have a nice algebraic expression or the number we're factoring. But we're going to aim for the next record to be back in the Mersenne type one, so if it's a factorization attempt, <laughs> still debating. So we're looking for some exponent on the Cunningham tables below about 1,200, but above 1,039 for the next run. And number field sieves take so much longer, we want to invest the time now to get rid of anything that might be easy. This is the EPFL in Switzerland. And it's using the PlayStation, which is single instruction, multiple data. Essentially, this thing of it is working on four different streams at one time. They all have to branch it together at the same place, and, and this, they should all be indexing the same address relative to their bases. So, but things like exponentiation, as long as everybody's doing the doubling at the same time, everybody doing an add, then we just got some nice pattern going. And we have to be careful for the modular add type code where some pro curves need to subtract off the modulus that is given step and others don't. But have to get these worked out. The, Algorithm which is over well. Yes. And so we used the PlayStation 3 and, and it was on Switzerland. We've gotten six big cases, like 68 digit number with. 246 digit left over prime. And that's it. Okay. Question? PlayStation stats. This oh. slide. Request for the PlayStation stats. Oh. Yeah. Well, I don't have the CPU speed and such, oh. although that's in some ePrint paper. These found the factors on the next page. So. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, over a nine-month interval so far. So it's totals about one and a half million curbs run. Other questions? Let's thank Peter again. The next talk is at four. Yeah.